Well, good morning on a beautiful day in downtown Unionville, Ontario. Welcome to Central United's virtual service on Sunday, June 7th. My name is Lindsay Duffield, and I'll be assisting with the service today. Last week, uh, Reverend Dr. Victor Shepherd did such an inspiring job. We're pleased to have you back here again this week leading our service. And it's always great to see Sarah back at the keys at the piano this morning. You may be a member or a guest of Central United watching live or watching a recorded service later on this week. Regardless, we are delighted to have you with us here today. You are always welcome. Be blessed as we share worship together in our Savior's name, anticipating his presence among us. Let me turn to the announcements right now, which were sent out earlier in the week and also posted on the church website. Let me highlight a few. We are streaming the virtual services <clears throat> every Sunday at 10 a.m. The live stream and past service videos are accessed via the church website. Please spread the good news to your family, your friends, and your extended social network. We are in a virtual world these days, but we still have physical bills to pay to keep the church running. You can continue to contribute versus the pre-authorized debit plan or through the Donate Now button on the church website or by mailing checks to the church. And thank you for your continuing generosity as we navigate these turbulent COVID-19 times. I'd also like to remind everyone about the weekly Zoom prayer meetings at 7 p.m. on Thursday evenings. Access instructions are in the bulletin or, and in the announcements and also on the website. This week, after the prayer time, we're trying something new, and all interested participants can remain on the call for a time of open discussion, reconnecting, and fellowship afterwards. Your worship committee has organized a special donation memorial fund for Valerie Klubine as a beautification project for our sanctuary, the purchase of 14 gel-filled candelabra candles will provide a fitting and long-lasting tribute to Valerie. If you wish to contribute, please indicate candles on your donation. And finally, a shout out to my son Jordan on his 27th birthday today. Happy birthday, Jordan, and you better be up and watching. Let's now turn our attention to worship, grateful for our Savior's promise to be among us. Jesus said, if you continue in my word, you are truly my disciples. You will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. Let us worship our God, who gives himself to us in his Son, and whose truth makes us free indeed. Let us pray. Gracious God, you have come to us in the one from Nazareth. You shall come again when you conclude human history. You come again and again to us now, as often as the day is new. Open our ears this day to hear you. Open our eyes to see you. Open our hearts to love you, that we might ever know this day, today, to be the hour of our visitation. Amen. Amen. Let's sing together today. There is only a few of us in the sanctuary, but we are all gonna sing together a song that you all know very well. And let's praise God be unto your name. We are a moment you We are a vapor. 
We're now at the point in the service where we pass the peace. In normal times, as you remember, this is a noisy and engaging and fun time where everybody gets a few moments to interact and with warm hugs and firm handshakes. Well, we can't do that right now. Hopefully, with God's help, we'll be back soon. So in the meantime, we'll do it virtually. The peace of Christ be with you and also with you. I will now read Psalm 8. O Lord, our sovereign, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. Out of the mouths of babes and infants, you have founded a bulwark because of your foes to silence the enemy and the avenger. When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars that you have established, what are human beings that you are mindful of them, mortals that you care for them, Yet you have made them a little lower than God and crowned them with glory and honor. You have given them dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under their feet, all sheep and oxen, and also the beasts of the field, the birds of the air and the fish of the sea, whatever passes along the paths of the seas. O Lord, our sovereign, how majestic is your name in all the earth. I now invite you to join us in the prayer of confession. We pray this prayer together, followed by our silent and personal prayers. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, who sat at the table with outcasts and sinners, we confess that too often our words and actions are not consistent with our beliefs. Often we fail to do the just thing. We have not always loved kindness. Sometimes our pride causes us to stumble from the path of walking humbly with you. Forgive us, we pray. Hear what wonderful words our Savior Christ says to all that truly turn to him. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, to the end that all that believe in him should not perish but have eternal life. Thanks be to God. And now, boys and girls, it's time for the children's story. After last week's exciting story about snakes, I'm very looking forward to see what Reverend Shepherd has up his robes today. Yes, indeed. Last Sunday we talked about snakes. Our Lord has said that we're to be wise as serpents or snakes, harmless as doves. 
and I brought along two snake skins. Now, some people were a little upset, perhaps, thinking I had brought along live snakes. I haven't done that yet, but my two snake skins, one was from a boa constrictor in the Peruvian jungle, and the other snake skin was from Taiwan. I called a Taiwan beauty. Weren't the skins beautiful? I thought they were. I thought that today we would talk, instead of snakes, we've done that, we would talk about donkeys. Donkeys are important in scripture because it was a donkey who carried Mary from Nazareth to Bethlehem for the birth of our Lord, and it was another donkey that carried Jesus into Jerusalem on the triumphal entry of Palm Sunday in anticipation of the victory over sin and death and evil acquired and achieved in his death. I didn't bring anything from the donkey today. I didn't bring a donkey skin or a donkey hoof. We're just going to have to think about donkeys together. You know, there are 40 million donkeys in the world right now, and they have been around here for a long time, 5,000 years. <clears throat> Many people think that the donkey is a poor version of a horse, but it's really a different animal from a horse. Donkeys are very intelligent. They are very hard workers. Because they are quiet and gentle, they're very easy to be around. They're not emotionally spastic like so many people who are difficult to be around. And the donkey does a lot to help poorer people with their work, poorer people who cannot afford a horse. Now, a donkey has a very loud bray. When the donkey brays loudly, he can be heard up to three kilometers away. Everybody knows that a donkey has big ears, right? And a donkey has big ears for two reasons. One is the donkey is able to hear better. But the other reason is the donkey's big, big ears are part of the cooling mechanism of the donkey's body. As blood flows through his big ears, the donkey's body is cooled. Some people think that donkeys are stubborn, but a donkey isn't stubborn at all. When he appears stubborn, it's rather that the donkey has a heightened perception of danger or threat to him. The donkey is more self-aware of danger than a horse is. Therefore, the donkey will appear to be stubborn when really all he's doing is protecting himself. And above all, donkeys are wonderfully loyal to their master. So, children who are listening this morning, what are we going to learn about from the donkey about becoming and remaining disciples of Jesus Christ? Well, the first point we're going to start with is the last point I made, namely that we must always be loyal to our master we must relish and enjoy the company of the master himself. And like the donkey who is intelligent, we're going to aspire to be thoughtful about the truth of the gospel, ever learning as much about our Lord as we can. We're going to be diligent and faithful and loyal in our work like the donkey, especially on behalf of poorer people. We're always going to be companionable, and not least, like the donkey who appears stubborn but really has a heightened sense of danger, we're always going to be alert to spiritual threats that might impair our relationship with Jesus Christ. Now, the next time you might see a donkey, it's harder to see a donkey these days, you're more likely to see a horse. But the next time you see a donkey, just remember what role the donkey played in the ministry and life of our Lord and what we can learn from the donkey about being a disciple of Jesus Christ. Let us pray together in the words our Savior taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen.
Our first scripture lesson this morning from the Older Testament is found in the 36th chapter of the book of the prophet Ezekiel, beginning to read at verse 22. Therefore, say to the house of Israel, thus says the Lord God, it is not for your sake, O house of Israel, that I am about to act, but for the sake of my holy name that you have profaned among the nations to which you came. I will sanctify my great name, which has been profaned among the nations, and which you have profaned among them. And the nations shall know that I am the Lord, says the Lord God, when through you I display my holiness before their eyes. I will take you from the nations and gather you from all your own uh, countries and bring you into your own land. I will sprinkle clean water upon you, and you shall be clean from all your uncleannesses, and from all your idols I will cleanse you. A new heart I will give you, and a new spirit I will put within you, and I will remove from your body the heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. And our epistle lesson this morning is found in 1 Peter, 1 Peter chapter 1, beginning to read at verse 22. Now that you have purified your souls by your obedience to the truth so that you have a genuine mutual love, love one another deeply from the heart. You have been born anew, not of perishable, but of imperishable seed through the living and enduring word of God. For all flesh is like grass, and all its glory like the flower of grass. The grass withers and the flower falls, but the word of the Lord endures forever. That word is the good news that was announced to you. Rid yourselves, therefore, of all malice and all guile, insincerity, envy, and all slander. Like newborn infants long for the pure spiritual milk, so that by it you may grow into salvation, if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good. And our gospel lesson this morning... Our gospel lesson is found in the book of Matthew, chapter 18, verses 1 to 14. At that time, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Jesus called a child whom he put among them and said, Truly I tell you, unless you change and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoever becomes humble like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me. If any of you put a stumbling block before one of these little ones who believe in me, it would be better for you if a great millstone were fastened around your neck and you were drowned in the depths of the sea. Woe to the world because of stumbling blocks. Occasions for stumbling are bound to come, but woe to the one by whom the stumbling block comes. If your hand or your foot causes you to stumble, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to enter life maimed or lamed than to have two hands or two feet and be thrown into the eternal fire. And if your eye causes you to stumble, tear it out and throw it away. It is better for you to enter life with one eye than to have two eyes and be thrown into the hell of fire. Take care that you do not despise one of these little ones. For, I tell you, in heaven their angels continually see the face of my Father in heaven. What do you think? If a shepherd has a hundred sheep and one of them has gone astray, does he not leave the ninety-nine on the mountains and go in search of the one that went astray? And if he finds it, truly I tell you, he rejoices over it more than over the ninety-nine that never went astray. So it is not the will of your Father in heaven that one of these little ones should be lost. 
Thanks be to God for these readings from his own holy word. The congregation's ministry to the congregation, four essential aspects. First of all, the congregation is a nursery for the newborn. Peter writes, like newborn babes, long for the pure spiritual milk that by it you may grow up to salvation, for you have tasted the kindness of the Lord. Now, when Peter addresses certain Christians as newborn babes, he isn't finding fault at all. He isn't saying that newborn babes shouldn't be newborn or shouldn't be drinking pure spiritual milk. In everyday life, nobody faults a baby for being a baby. Nobody faults the three-month-old because she isn't 30 years old. It's normal for a baby to be a baby and to be treated like a baby. It's wonderful to see any baby eager to drink milk. Several times in Matthew's Gospel, Jesus angrily denounces those who make things difficult for the little ones. Whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for that person, says our Lord, if concrete blocks were tied to his feet and he were pitched into Lake Ontario. Ten seconds later, Jesus, still upset, let's fly again. See that you do not despise one of these little ones. It is not the will of my Father in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. The little ones Jesus speaks of over and over again and concerning whom he's so very protective. These little ones are not five-year-olds. The little ones are adults, adult men and women who happen to be new in the faith. The little ones are adults, 30, 45, 60 years old, who have, however, only recently bonded with Jesus Christ. As old as they might be chronologically, they are spiritual neonates. They need milk, milk only for now, so that they may thrive spiritually. Jesus never faults them for being mere little ones. On the contrary, he deems them so very precious that he guarantees the severest retribution to anyone who inhibits in any way the spiritual growth of the newest disciple. The babes in Christ have to be nursed, and the church is a nursery for the newborn. What do we expect from a nursery, any nursery? What would we expect, insist on, if we were taking our own child to a nursery? Safety. Safety, first of all, safety above everything else. You wouldn't leave your child in a nursery for 30 seconds if the nursery couldn't guarantee the security of your child. Now, when we speak of safety in the church, I'm not minimizing for one minute the physical security, the bodily safety that any congregation has to guarantee people who are found on its precincts. I'm not minimizing that. At the same time, that isn't the major point I'm making. The point I'm making today has to do with the preservation and integrity and substance of the gospel. There has to be spiritual safety ensured in any congregation at any time. Think of the most elemental confession found on the lips of the earliest Christians. It is, Jesus is Lord. Early day little ones, and not so little ones, clung to this truth when Caesar is Lord was being screamed at them every day. When political authorities sneered, we'll show you who's Lord. We'll show you in the Colosseum where wild animals haven't yet learned that Jesus is Lord. We'll show you in the mines in whose damp darkness you're going to spend the rest of your lives. We'll show you on unpopulated islands where you are going to be exiled until you rot. 
as happened with John the Seer. When this happened, our Christian foreparents could only gasp out three simple words. Centuries later, when it was announced throughout Germany that Hitler ist Führer, the same faithful cry went up from the same faithful few. What those who dislike saying Jesus is Lord seem not to understand <clears throat> is that to say Jesus is Lord is to say something about him, of course, but not only about him, is also to say something about us who utter it. Namely, by the grace of God, we have been admitted to truth. It's also to say something about the world. The world is not the kingdom of God, but is riddled with falsehood, treachery, and turbulence at all times. In the midst of all the talk today about spirituality, do you notice how often we use the word spirituality in the church and outside of it for that matter? How many people have you heard say, I'm spiritual but not religious? I don't like the talk. I wish with all my heart we would return to talking about faith because faith presupposes Jesus Christ everywhere as author and object. Jesus Christ, in the power of the Holy Spirit, quickens in you and made the faith that seizes him. The talk about spirituality, to me, is too vague to be helpful. It can include anything from whale-watching to tree-hugging. Never mind, if we're going to talk about spirituality, we ought to remember that not all the spirits are holy. Unholy spirits are always ready to infest and infect. Now, in many hymnals, the words of the old hymn, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so, that's been changed very slightly but profoundly to Jesus loves me, this I know, and the Bible tells me so. Now, the change of wording indicates that Scripture is no longer acknowledged as the source and the norm of our knowledge of God. At best, Scripture can only reflect what we think we can learn of God elsewhere. This, my friends, is paganism, and to that extent, spiritually lethal. The members of a congregation must ensure that there's safety in the congregation. <clears throat> it's crucial that the congregation be a nursery where the little ones are safe. Crucial that this congregation be a nursery <clears throat> where pure spiritual milk is kept unsoured. Crucial that this congregation nourish and never cause to stumble those little ones who have tasted the kindness of the Lord and who want only to become spiritual adults. <clears throat> Speaking of nourishment, nourishment is plainly the second thing we look for in a nursery. After all, babes remain in a nursery for quite a while. They have to be fed there or else they won't thrive. Now, babes don't get fed once. <clears throat> babes get fed small amounts frequently. Babes get fed small amounts so very frequently that frequently amounts to constantly. They absorb nourishment cumulatively. The more they are fed, the greater their capacity to absorb. The greater their capacity to absorb, the more they are fed. Plainly, there's an incrementalism at work in the nourishing of babes. Let's remember that however sophisticated most people are in many areas of life, more often than not, the same people, however sophisticated elsewhere, are babes in Christ. They're the little ones. The nursery has to ensure nourishment. Purer spiritual milk must always be ready to hand. As much as safety and nourishment must be found in a nursery, so must affection. Everyone knows of the experiments and the conclusion of the experiments concerning babies who were picked up and those who were left crying, babies who were cuddled and those who were isolated. Babies who were caressed and kissed and cooed to and, th and those whose physical needs were attended to unfailingly. Everyone knows the difference it made to the babies at the time 
and more tellingly, what difference it came to make to the same person, now an adult, years later. Everyone knows that affection warming an infant makes the profoundest difference eventually to the adult, to the adult's self, the adult's self-esteem and self-confidence, resilience, and adventuresomeness. It's no less the case in the nursery of faith. The babes among us have to be safeguarded, protected, yes. They have to be nourished, yes. But always and everywhere they have to be cherished. Affection is as essential as food. The congregation isn't nursery only. In the second place, it's also a school where we are to be taught. Schools exist for teaching, which is to say, someone has to be taught and something has to be taught. Frequently we hear it said, faith is caught, not taught. It's said as if it were self-evidently the soul of wisdom, but it isn't self-evident, and neither is it the soul of wisdom. At best, it's a half-truth. The half-truth, faith is caught, is true in that faith is a living relationship with a living person, not an intellectual abstraction. Fine. Faith is caught, not taught, is a half-truth true, in that no relationship of person with person can be reduced to a proposition. Good. But it's only a half-truth in that unless something is caught, taught, in fact, unless a great deal is taught, the person whom the truths describe and point to and commend can never be encountered and therefore never known. Those who insist that faith is caught, not taught, why do they never ask themselves why Jesus taught day in and day out throughout his earthly ministry? Jesus spent more time teaching in his earthly ministry than he did doing any other single thing. Shouldn't it this tell us something? At the very least, it should tell us that events are not self-interpreting. No event in world occurrence is ever self interpreting. Jesus could never merely do something and then assume that everyone who observed him took home the correct meaning of what he had done. Quite the contrary, he always assumed that they weren't going to take home the correct meaning of what he had done unless he told them. Prior to his death and after it, Jesus taught any who would listen concerning the meaning and force and significance of his death if he hadn't taught them the significance of his death, they would assume that his death meant no more than the deaths of the two criminals crucified on either side of him, no more than the deaths of any miscreant whom the state executes in any country at any time. Not only would people not take home the correct meaning of our Lord's activity, they would certainly take home the wrong meaning. No event in world occurrence is ever self-interpreting. There's a story about Francis of Assisi that warms many hearts. It may or may not be a true story about St. Francis, but in any case, it's a story I don't like. In fact, the story is so gosh awful bad that I'm convinced it has to be apocryphal. Well, by now you all want to hear the story. So here it is. A fellow friar asked Francis to join him in preaching outdoors throughout the city. Francis consented and then added, but before we preach, we are going to walk throughout the city. When they had finished walking, the two men together throughout the length and the breadth of the city, the fellow friar impatiently asked Francis, but when do we get to preach? We just did, replied Francis. We walked around. We just did. Oh, it's a sweet romantic story dripping with saccharine sentimentality, but it's only half true. 
The half-truth, of course, is that the preacher's life and the preacher's utterance ought to be consistent. Fine. But no person's life, even a saint's life, not even Jesus Christ's life unambiguously declares the gospel. If Christ's life had bespoken the truth unambiguously, why on earth would he have bothered to teach? We always have to be taught. We have to be taught answers to life questions in as much as the answers are important. In fact, the answers are crucial. And if the answers are crucial, so are the questions. Think of the questions, or at least some of them. Question, who is God? Well, some will say most elementally, God is creator. Correct. I want you to notice, however, that scripture says very, very little about God as creator. And in fact, for every word that scripture pronounces about God as creator, scripture pronounces 50 words about God as destroyer. When's the last time you heard a sermon on God the destroyer? Question, who is God? Someone says yet again, well, God's creator. Yes, we know that. But scripture says very little about God as creator compared to what it says about the search for a suitable wife for Isaac. The Bible goes on paragraph after paragraph, page after page about the search for a suitable wife for Isaac. Why? Now I know what the clever among us are going to think this morning. The clever among us are going to say, it's because it's easier to create the whole vast universe out of nothing than it is to find a suitable mate. I'll let that go for now. The truth is, Scripture says so much about the search for a suitable wife for Isaac because Isaac and his wife together have to carry forward the covenant people of God and without a suitable covenant mate, the covenant people of God dribbles into the ground. Question. Why is it that Jesus describes his most intimate followers, not hangers-on, not fringe people, his most intimate followers, as possessed of but the tiniest pipsqueak faith? Question. Why do Christians regard as normative for faith and life an Older Testament that is four times longer than the Newer Testament? Why do we need the Older Testament at all? What would happen if we set it aside? What has happened in the history of the church when the Older Testament has been set aside? Well, a great deal has happened, none of it any good. And worst of all, when the Older Testament is consistently neglected or worse, submerged, a wicked anti-Semitism surfaces in the church. Question. Why is it that the only physical description of Jesus that the apostles give us? Do you know what it is? The apostles never tell us whether Jesus was short or tall, fat or skinny, blue-eyed or blonde-haired. You'll notice that in the pictures we have in our church basement, Jesus always has blue eyes and shoulder-length blonde hair. Why do we paint him looking so Dutch? I don't know why, because the apostles give us no physical description of him at all, with one exception. They tell us that he was circumcised. Now what kind of a picture are you going to paint with that much information? Listen, the apostles know that it doesn't matter a fig to our faith whether Jesus was short or tall, doesn't matter a fig to our faith what he looked like, but it matters everything to your faith and mind that our Lord was and is a son of Israel. Question. Why did our Hebrew foreparents regard idolatry, murder, and adultery as the three most heinous sins? Why do we modern degenerates, on the other hand, regard murder as criminal, adultery as trivial, idolatry as nothing at all, and none of them is sin. Jesus assumed that truth isn't self-evident. 
Jesus assumed, in other words, that the meaning of the most obvious event isn't itself obvious at all. Therefore, Jesus assumed that we always have to be taught. And the congregation is a school in which Christ's people are taught. In the third place, the congregation is also an army that fights. Christians today aren't ready to hear this. We don't mind being a nursery or a school, but an army? An army that fights? Aren't we followers of the Prince of Peace? Aren't we called to be peacemakers? Now, I have noticed that those who are repelled by any suggestion that the congregation is an army are repelled because of the notion of fighting. I have noticed, too, however, that the same people who abhor any Christian reference to fighting will fight instantly if Canada Revenue Agency gets their income tax assessment wrong or is suspected of getting it wrong. They will fight instantly if their child is awarded a low grade on a school project. They will fight instantly as soon as they hear that their employer has plans to alter working conditions or compensation or holidays. After all, their cause is right. Therefore, it has to be righteous. How much more is at stake when the truth of Jesus Christ collides with the falsehoods of the evil one? How much more is at stake when someone is victimized and rendered a casualty in the midst of that spiritual warfare she was never even aware of, or perchance was aware of? No wonder Paul picks up the metaphor of soldiering and urges the congregation in Ephesus to put on the whole armor of God, shield, shoes, helmet, breastplate, sword. There's nothing God-honoring about being an unnecessary victim. No wonder, too, that Paul reminds young Timothy that soldiering entails hardship, sacrifice, single-mindedness, training in godliness, he calls it. No wonder he gathers it all up by urging the young men always to fight the good fight of the faith. We can't fight unless we have trained. Training? Many church folk today see no point to training just because they see nothing Christian about fighting. They think that conflict, conflict is always and everywhere sub-Christian because non-loving. And they are wrong. They're wrong. In the first place, our Lord leaves us no choice. If we are going to be disciples, then we are going to be soldiers in that conflict which erupts the moment his flag of truth is planted in the citadel of a hostile world. Since the master was immersed in conflict every day, just read the written gospels. Every day in his public ministry, there's a flare up. Since the master was immersed in conflict every day, what makes his followers think they won't be or shouldn't be? John Wesley, the Methodist progenitor of this congregation here in Unionville, when John Wesley was a sleepy-eyed, drowsing Anglican clergyman, his life was conflict-free. Then on May the 24th, 1738, the Spirit lit him and his public ministry took off in an expression the world will never forget. And from 1738 until Wesley died, 1791, he was knee deep in conflict every day. In the second place, those who regard all conflict as sub-Christian because unloving fail to see that spiritual conflict arises on account of love's energy. God is love. Jesus is the incarnation of God's nature. Jesus, who is love incarnate, is immersed in conflict every day just because love is resisted every day. Love is contradicted every day. Love is savaged every day. What kind of love is it that won't persist in the face of opposition? won't contend to vindicate the slandered and oppressed, won't fend off every effort of lovelessness to victimize and abandon. Listen, love that won't persist and contend 
Love that refuses to fight is simply no love at all. In the third place, the most love-filled heart knows that there is a place for godly resistance. Now, I'm speaking now of godly resistance. I'm not speaking of irritability or petulance or childish hair-trigger temper. I'm speaking of godly resistance. When Martin Luther, grief-stricken at the horrible abuses of the church in his day, and grief-stricken still more at the subversion of the gospel, when Luther finally stopped weeping and decided to do something, he discussed what he planned to do with Professor Jerome Scherf of Wittenberg University. Now, Professor Scherf was professor in the faculty of law. He was one of the brightest academic stars in the Wittenberg University firmament. Professor Jerome Scherf agreed with Luther that the abuses were dreadful and the compromised gospel deplorable. Scherf, however, was aghast at what Luther planned to do. Don't do that, he cried. You'll render us all targets here. We'll all be in trouble in Wittenberg. The authorities will never put up with it. And if the authorities have to put up with it, said Luther, if they have to, to live in the company of Jesus Christ is never to relish conflict for the sake of conflict. To live in the company of Jesus Christ is never to go looking for a fight. It isn't to walk around with a chip on our shoulder. But to live in the company of Jesus Christ is to share his conflict. To live in the company of Jesus Christ is to share love's struggle in the face of unloves militancy. And lastly, the congregation is also a hospital for the wounded. When the Apostle Paul discusses the different ministries to be exercised in any one congregation, he includes healing. If healing is to be exercised within the congregation, then the congregation's a hospital. We must understand that there's no shame in being hospitalized just because there's no shame in being wounded. The fact that we are wounded simply confirms the truth that we are soldiers in Christ's army and only recently have been on the front lines. Spiritual conflict is no less debilitating than any other kind of conflict. One military facility for the battle worn is the Rest and Recreation Center. R&R centers don't exist simply for military personnel who have broken a leg or fractured a skull. R&R centers principally accommodate those who have been under immense pressure, stress. They're frazzled now and need to move behind the lines for a while in order to recuperate. During World War II, all submarine crews were given as much time off to recuperate as they spent on patrol. A month long on patrol in an iron coffin at sea was always followed by a month's rest ashore. No one ever suggested that there was something shameful in the men's need for rest. Rest. Jesus invites us, come to me, all who labor and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Rest, however, has special force in scripture. Rest in scripture doesn't have the modern meaning of vegging utter inactivity, doing nothing, rest. Ever since Genesis 3 in the story of the fall, rest in scripture has to do with restoration. Come up to me, says Jesus, all who are bone weary and worn down and frazzled and fractured and frantic, come to me because with me there is restoration. We should note that our Lord's winsome invitation Come unto me. Is there any invitation in scripture any more winsome than that? It's not an invitation at all. Look at the grammatical form of our Lord's utterance. It's a command. Come. He isn't saying, won't you come, or isn't it good to come? Come. You come. Right now. Plainly, it's an imperative. He commands us to come to him for restoration. 
To say it's a command is to say there's no option here. We must go to him for restoration just because he knows that his soldiers are beaten up. And once beaten up, aren't much use until restored. In other words, providing hospital care for Christ's wounded is as much the congregation's ministry to the congregation as is being a nursery where newborns are nurtured and a school where learners are taught and an army where soldiers are trained and in which they fight the good fight of the faith until that day when we all say with the apostle, I have fought the good faith fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. Amen. Let's, re let's respond by singing a song, Make Me a Channel of Your Peace. It's also from a prayer with St. Francis of Assisi. Today is Trinity Sunday, the first Sunday following Pentecost, and in conformity with the practice of the Church Catholic throughout the world, we are going to repeat together the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again and ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. 
I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us pray together. Eternal God, as your word has fallen upon us today, and as your spirit has welled up within us once more, we know afresh that our need at this moment is our need at every moment. We need our Lord Jesus Christ to be made to shine so brightly that we shall see him only, and to see in him those whom you have given us in him to love, to cherish, to care for, to lift up before you, and to spend ourselves upon until that day when none shall be needy, all shall be fulfilled, and the only cry heard will be the praises with which your people acclaim you. Until that day, awaken us to that love with which you love us now so as to leave us contented. Sensitize us to that pain with which our neighbor suffers so as to leave us thinking only of the distress of others. Acquaint us with the riches to be found in our Lord so as to leave us knowing we are wealthy whether we have much or little. And then let your spirit nudge us, prod us, prompt us, persist with us, that we might see the person whom the world overlooks, we might discern the opportunity which otherwise slips by unnoticed, we might seize that moment which can be seized only once and can never be recovered. All of this we ask, pleading the mediator you have given us, for he envied nothing, gave everything, and now lives to intercede for us. It is in his name, the name of our blessed Lord Jesus Christ, that we gather up our prayers before you, our Father, this day. Amen. Go forth now in the power of the Holy Spirit to fulfill your high calling as servants and soldiers of Jesus Christ. And the blessing of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit rest upon you and remain with you always. <laughs>